The Balance of Well-Being, The Alexander Technique, a unique approach to changing your life by changing your posture. Hello, my name is William Hurt, and it is my fortunate privilege today to serve two undemanding and happy functions. One is to be a student, to let myself learn, to fall back and let an expert teach me. The other is to introduce you to my teacher. Jane Kosminski will demonstrate her understanding of human energy in a technique that can permit any person to discover and utilize an endless resource within themselves. I have the happy job to surrender to an adventure Jane will guide. The brief, exciting trip she and I will take together today was first undertaken by an intrepid, generous, compassionate individual named F. M. Alexander. She will tell us all about that and more. Any difficulty for me is now over, as it is my great privilege to introduce to you Jane Kosminski. Thank you, William. You're welcome, Jane. I guess I better do something to earn that high praise. Let's just notice where you're sitting, okay? And without doing very much, I'd like you to begin to free your neck, to let your head move up. I'm going to bring you a little bit more onto your sit bones. And we're going to allow your shoulders to release out to the side. Great. And float on the rib cage. And we're going to breathe. Fabulous. Now, that's the Alexander Technique in part, and that's what we're going to learn about today. It is my joy and delight to tell you about F.M. Alexander, who he was, what he discovered, how it might help you, and then we will do a few things that you can join in on to see if you can begin to observe and work on some of these principles yourself. Frederick Matthias Alexander was a very interesting man. He was born in Wynyard, Northwest Tasmania, Australia in 1869 and he died in England in 1955. For some reason, this young man decided to become, of all things, a professional actor. Actually, he had developed a passion for Shakespeare. So off he went to the big city to become a Shakespearean monologist. Almost immediately, he developed vocal problems and rather serious ones for an actor. He found that he had shortness of breath and he kept losing his voice, much more, much more devastating. So. He went to the doctor, as most of us would. The doctor examined him, and he could find nothing wrong with his vocal cords. Eventually, there's an anecdote that comes down to us. This is not exactly the way he wrote about it in his book, but eventually, he had a rather important engagement, the equivalent of performing for every agent in the city of New York and Hollywood. So following doctor's orders, he did not speak for two weeks prior to the performance, but it didn't help. And the night of the event came, he got out on the stage and in front of a packed house, as the story is told, he lost his voice and they had to bring the curtain down. Did anything like that ever happen to you? It's the, it's the classic <laughs> actor's nightmare, you know. I, I used to have it, <clears throat> the nightmare used to be that I, would, I had produced and directed and was acting the leading role in an opera and I would go out there for the first uh, scene in full regalia face the assembled thousands and thousands, open my mouth and nothing would come out of it. But actually there was something that did happen to me. I used to have pretty serious nerves, I think as any performer does, at different stages of their career. And there was a time when I would come on and if it was a particularly verbal role, my lips would start to cramp on me. I mean literally cramp and they would... <laughs> <laughs> they would start to close. They would close so tight that I couldn't get them open. I would have to turn up stage and try to pry them apart with my fingers and try to get things loosened up. But it was pretty funny seeing me going around trying to make sounds like this. 
But I used Alexander technique uh, in solving that problem. Ah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is really interesting. At the time that this happened to Alexander, of course, there was no Alexander technique. He went back to the doctor like most of us would. I probably would have killed the doctor, but he didn't. He allowed himself to be examined again, and again, the doctor could find nothing wrong with his vocal cords. So he asked a very interesting question. He said, am I doing something that's causing me to lose my voice? And the doctor was honest. He said, probably. And Alexander said, what? And the doctor said, I don't know. So being of a truly scientific bent of mind, Alexander bought three huge mirrors and began to watch himself speak to see if he could discover what he did and where he might be going wrong. It is his process and the conscious use of himself that we call the Alexander Technique. Now, the question becomes, of course, what did he discover? This is what he discovered, and I'm going to tell you, it took him nine years, I'm going to tell you, hopefully in nine minutes, what he discovered is that every time he opened his mouth to deliver a monologue, several things happened. He tightened his neck, he thrust his head back of the cervical spine, and he hyperextended, he pushed into his rib cage. Would you like to try that? Would you like to try that? Yes, Jane. Yes, I would. Go like for that. it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Tighten your neck. Thrust your head back. Push into your rib cage. Say ah. 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 It's what right. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear the sound. You can hear the hoarseness. Yeah. This is what happens to all of us when we try this. And if you do it loud enough and long enough, you too will lose your voice. I have a theory about this. I think he was playing to the second balcony. He, I think it was the style of acting of the day and that he was imitating, like lots of young people do, the kind of acting that was popular and exemplary at the time. What do you think? Annunciatory. Yeah. Yeah. Very. So a lot of tension in it. <laughs> a lot of tension in and it. Maybe as an artist he was more sensitive. So. I don't know. Anyway, he discovered that not only did he do this, activity when he, this tightening and thrusting and pushing, every time he opened his mouth for the stage, he discovered after an enormous amount of exploration that the same things happened, the same habits of use happened when he opened his mouth to speak to anyone about anything. It was infinitely more subtle, of course, but there he had these same habits of use. Of course, you can see immediately that the first one is going to affect the voice. But the second one was equally serious because of the breath. And the breath, of course, is something without which we cannot be for any activity. So I'd like you to make an experiment for me. I want you to put your hands on your rib cage, any part of your rib cage, and I'd like you to really push your ribs forward so that it's not very comfortable. And I'd like you to take a huge breath. Where does the breath go? <laughs> it, it's all jammed up in here. Yeah. Mm. Do you know, you realize how often people say, stand up straight, and this is exactly what people do? A lot of soldiers do that. A lot of soldiers do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, now let's breathe in a little more wholesome way. Mm. Let's let the rib cage drape down the way it does in the front and scoop up into the spine in the back. So here we are leaving the back back, and now I'd like you to take another deep breath. Oh. <laughs> what do you think? I got all of that one. Feel better? A lot better, yeah. yeah. Three or four times more, uh, more capacity and just satisfaction. I agree. This is very important because we must, I think, agree to include the breath in our awareness. When we include the breath in our awareness and allow the breath to function inside the rib cage three-dimensionally the way it really does, then we can change how we use ourselves and how we function. Then you might ask yourself, what can I do about this? You know, what am I going to do? I have this information that I do certain things. I may compress, I may push into my ribs, I may do a lot of stuff that is not good for me. What do I do about it? How can I change it? What Alexander discovered was that if, at the very moment when he was about to open his mouth to speak, he could choose not to speak, to pause, 
to inhibit speaking. And instead, he could loosen the muscles of his neck and allow his head to rotate forward and up away from the top of the spine. He triggered a mechanism in the body in which the head moved up and the spine followed. When he did this loosening of the neck muscles and the rotation of the head to allow it to move in the direction of up, he found he could speak without losing his voice. It is this activity or this non-activity that we call inhibition, the choice not to respond habitually. Now that doesn't mean to be an inhibited person. What do you mean by free the neck? <laughs> is a person not normally free in their neck? I mean, freeing well, the neck is, 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 is the tension habitual and is freeing it something that would be an unusual thing to do? You have to f yeah. It would. Let me tell you about Free the Neck. Every mm. time somebody asks me about Free the Neck, I have to giggle. When I first started teaching, mm. a man came for lessons because his wife wanted him to. As a matter of fact, she insisted that he come. Right away, I knew I was in big trouble. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, she came, I think, to the first lesson. And I suggested th to this man that he free his neck. And he turned and he looked at me and he said, what do you mean, free the neck? And of course, I had just begun teaching. I was quite startled and went into startled response, took a deep breath and said, to free the neck means to loosen the muscles of your neck, to allow the neck to be soft and easy like a baby's neck. So your children have free necks. Mm. It's you and I that run into trouble. What exactly do you mean by forward and up? Is, that a, is, is it a large movement, a small one? Is it one that's forced? Is it one that's permitted or allowed? Is it Ah, forward means forward in relationship to your spine. So let me give you an example. Take two fingers. Pretend that they are an imaginary rod running through your ears. Great. Now, if we take the head up and over that rod and back and down, this would be not a good place to be. First of all, I can't talk very well this way. Second of all, I look very silly. And third of all, I can't breathe very well because my whole chest has collapsed. Now, if we free the neck and allow the head to ro rotate up and over that rod, this would be forward and up. That's the easiest balancing point for the head at the top of the spine. That's forward and up. It doesn't mean that you can't move your head every place. Of course you can. We're people, and we should. But this is the place where the, you can get the greatest length up the spine when the head is balanced forward and up. Now, the interesting question becomes, how do you do it? I'm going to tell you. This is fun. Let me introduce you to Blanche. Blanche wears a button. William, I'm going to ask you to please read Blanche's button. This button does nothing. Can you? Exactly. In the Alexander Technique, we don't do anything. We think. And because of the way our brains are constructed, when we think an image in conjunction with our own anatomy, we can affect change in our musculature, physical change, in our musculature and in our movement. Uh, this is one of the principles behind the biofeedback work. This is part of the visualization techniques that people are using today. Both athletes are using visualization technique and terminally ill patients are using visual, visualization techniques. I got it out. It is a vital part of the Alexander work that we think in order to make a change. Now, William, if I said to you, I would like you to imagine your right hand growing out of your left kneecap. The other one. My left knee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. We would be here till the millennia, and I assure you, nothing would happen. Mm. But if I ask you to think an image in conjunction with your anatomy, something may happen. Let's try something. Okay, you can all try with us. Trying not to interfere with yourself. Let's use the downstage arm, okay? Let's do this. Let's just think about the hand. The hand. Imagine it to be an arrow falling into the earth. And I'd like you to think of your forearm, like the shaft of that arrow being drawn down by that arrow. And I'd like you to think of your elbow as hail following the arrow. 
And after that, I'd like you to think of your upper arm as rain. Imagine your upper arm falling like rain down forever into the earth. Great. Now, if you lift your hand and measure it against the other one, you might have made a change. A lot. Now, of course, gravity is working for us. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie about that. And of course, um, but there's something else to remember. So are our minds, and so is our anatomy. Of course, we have not changed the length of the bones. That would be absurd. But what we have done is increase the space in the joints and increase the habitual resting length of the muscle. This is how we think in the Alexander Technique. We think to free the neck. We do rotate the head if it's pulling back and down. <laughs> we do rotate the, head, rotate the head forward and up. But we think to allow the head to move up. So we begin in Alexander with observation. What are you doing? What am I doing? Inhibition choosing not to respond habitually, and then something we call direction. Direction is composed of the four concepts, Alexander's four concepts of good use. To let the neck be free, to let the head be forward and up away from the top of the spine, to allow the torso to lengthen and fan into width, to allow the legs to release away from the hip joint, and to allow the shoulders to release out to the side and float on the rib cage. When we think our directions using these concepts of good use, we make an enormous change in the body. Sometimes we think nothing's happening. Ha! What happens to a lot of my students is they work for a while and go home to visit family. And they've been thinking their directions and doing their Alexander and noticing and choosing not to respond habitually. And they get home and they know they've made real changes in maybe three months. And their families look at them and say, mm, you look different. Did you get a haircut? So sometimes it is not obvious to other people what has been going on. But what is obvious is to the person inside how you feel, mm. how you mm. function, how you move, even what you look like. It's like the difference between how this looks and how it actually feels. I mean, to the casual eye, I don't think the, the movements are that stark. They're not. But the feeling is night and day. It is. I agree. You know, I, have, it's, I really agree. Here I am, an older woman. And when you do a lot of Alexander technique, you feel very light. It makes you feel very light and very buoyant and often very happy. Uh, so here I am walking around, heavier than I ever was when I was dancing, and feeling lighter. It's very seductive. <laughs> Now we're going to learn a little bit about how the Alexander Technique actually works. And to do this, I have my favorite model, Blanche. And I'm going to show you, William, you want to take that? Mm -hmm. What really goes on? The head is extremely heavy. It weighs between 12 and 15 pounds worth of weight. That heavy, heavy head sits at the end of the smallest, most vulnerable part of the spine. The spine actually acts as a unit. So whatever the head is doing is going to affect the whole. So if we are compressing down like this, we may be having pain in any part of our backs with that one. As we actually begin to release the neck, to free the neck, and allow the head to rotate forward and up, this is what starts to happen. And that's really the truth. We can go from here to here just by thinking. Now, the muscles of the neck hold the head on. They balance the head. They rotate the head. And they're extremely important because they support that head. When we are doing things like this or like this with our muscles, the neck muscles, what happens is we easily can lose our voices. When we stop doing this or this, the tongue can relax, the vocal cords can work, and we can alter general sound produc production almost immediately. I have a very funny story for you. I had a student last year, a big, tall, skinny dancer named Mark, and he was very, very tall, and he had a very 
high voice. And I said, thought to myself, something is going on that's not right here. His voice and his body don't match. And when I got him, or actually when we got him, to release some of the tension in his neck and his upper back, he scared himself to death. He had a bass voice, and it hasn't gone back. So I always know when he's using his directions because he really has a deep, rich voice. It was such a great example of the neck-head-spine relationship and how tension can alter sound production. This relationship also has a great deal to do with movement. The very idea that the head can lead the spine into, into length facilitates movement. And one of the most important things to do, and this is what I really love, is that notice with Blanche the beautiful curves of the spine. That is a miracle. You never want to flatten out the spine because when you flatten out your spine, you make yourself stiff and you can't really move. This, these beautiful curves, help us to move, help us to twist. Well, maybe not quite so much. (laughs) Help us to bend. We can jump. We can fall, and the whole idea is that we have a lively spine to do it. If we straighten out our spines, in Alexander Technique, you're never going to be asked, stand up straight, push your shoulders back. Isn't that lovely? I think so. What you want is all these luscious curves and the head balanced somewhat like a three-dimensional question mark at the top of the spine. This is a miracle, this body. And the Alexander Technique teaches us how to use that miracle easily, efficiently, with pleasure. Blanche. Thank you, Blanche. (laughs) Would you like to do a little work? I would love to. We're going to do classic Alexander work. We're going to take a look at how William gets in and out of a chair. Why do we do this particular work? We do classically, traditionally in Alexander, work on the chair, work on the table. The chair work is particularly powerful because it teaches us how to use, we can first of all, well it teaches us how to use our joints efficiently, but we can examine immediately how you do use your joints and what might be possible in terms of change if we just watch you getting in and out of a chair because you have to use your knees, your ankles, your hips, the neck, head, spine relationship. And so we learn a lot. And I'm going to invite you all to join us so that you can begin your own process of observation. And we're going to take a really close look at William. You ready? Come on. Okay. Wait. Notice what happens already. Can you see yourself revved to get out of the chair? Okay, great. So we've observed something. Take a moment to think, just to notice what your neck and head are doing, and just to let your neck be free, and to let your head move up. And even now, without any hands-on work, just let your head lead you right up. Fabulous. Let's go. We're going to begin with the chair work, the traditional classic chair work. But before we do, I'd like you to notice the mirror. The mirror is part of Alexander equipment, and it allows me to not only watch you as I can see you, close to you, but watch you in the mirror so that I can really watch what's happening with your back and your neck and your head and, so, and your legs and your arms. So, as unselfconsciously as possible, I'd like you to stand up and sit down. <laughs> Fabulous. Would you mind doing that again, please? Oh, interesting movement. And stand up one more time. Great. Can you tell what you're doing with your neck and your head and your spine when you do that? Yes, I took lessons from someone named Jane Kosminski once, (laughs) and I I can, actually. (laughs) Excellent. Now, we're going to tell everybody exactly what you were doing, because I think it's important, and I think a lot of people do just that, okay? Mm -hmm. So, this is a way that you can tell what you're doing when you get in and out of a chair that may be getting in the way of your ease and your fluidity. Put your hand at the back of your neck where your head and your neck join. And put your other hand at what my colleague Debbie Kaplan says, well, we call it the waist. My colleague Debbie Kaplan says, like the unicorn, the waist is a mythical creature. (laughs) So we're going to put our hands right there. See, and this is for people who are trying this at home, what really happens if you move slowly into the chair. Okay, and go ahead and do it. 
Yeah, that was already very different. What you were doing before, and I'm going to show you and exaggerate this on William, is he was thrusting his head forward, or what we call back and down. He was thrusting his neck forward. He was arching a little bit into his waist, lower back, and then he was getting up. So essentially, he was doing a movement that is great for the disco floor, right? Not so wonderful when you are getting in and out of a chair because using yourself in that way can really hurt the back. So we're going to do it a little bit differently, all right? We're going to take a moment to begin. We can start by standing. To begin by freeing the neck and letting the head move up the way we talked about before. Great. And as the head moves up, the torso lengthens and fans into width. Great. And I'm going to ask William to include his pelvis in the up. Don't do a thing yet. Just think about it for a moment. Let me grab Blanche. You'll notice, everybody, that the pelvis is actually a part of the torso. Very often people think that the pelvic girdle is part of the leg. So they press the pelvis onto the leg, and then the leg doesn't feel very wonderful, and neither do the hip joints. So when we use our direction, our thought to let the neck be free and let the head move forward and out, and we start to direct the spine toward the head, we want to include the whole pelvis as part of that activity. So we're going to do that right now allowing the neck to be free without moving. And William is going to look straight out. Great. Upper back goes up, mid back, lower back, tailbone. And all we're going to do is think up, let the pelvis follow the head and bend your knees. Great. So that we were really mm -hmm. using the joints. Does that feel any different? Completely. Completely different. And as, if we work out about on this in time, we will even get a stronger direction up and we will get less pivot on the joint. Is it important for us to try that now? We can. Let's go for it. Coming up, we want to do just the opposite, of course. We want to allow the neck to be free and allow the head to move up. Let's move very gently on the hip joints. I'm going to pivot you just a tad. Boom. That's it. That's all. Great. And we're going to free the neck and go up again. And I'm going to pivot you back on the joint. Do you know where your joints are? You know. Me? Yeah, you. Absolutely. Fantastic. <laughs> you want to tell everybody else? <laughs> Would you like me to? Where am I? You tell them where my joints are. <laughs> <laughs> the hip jo I'll tell them. The hip joints are here. Or the hip joints, three-dimensional joint, a ball and a socket joint, is here. For some of us, that means the joint is a little bit closer to the center than we think it is. If we're using our joints as though they're directly out here, we're going to have a lot of trouble getting up. But if we really use the joint where it is, the movement becomes very, very fluid. And of course, this isn't about getting in and out of a chair, is it? No. no. This is about no observation, inhibition and direction. And that's what we use the chair work for. So this time we're going to do the same thing coming out of the chair and we're going to see if we can use the joints very clearly, letting the neck be free, letting the head move out, letting your upper back be part of that flow of energy. And I'm not going to let you compress your head the least bit back. We're going forward and up. Fabulous. Upper back is part of that. I may stop you at any given moment. Stop now. Because we don't really care if we get out of the chair, because this isn't about getting out of the chair. Mm -hmm. This is about the process of getting out of the chair. Now you'll notice that your pelvis is following your head, and we can include leaving your back back and up. Press your heels into the ground. Come out of the chair. Was that a different feeling? Yeah, it's completely different. So what we notice is that you like to push a little bit into your ribcage the way most of us do. Guilty, trained as a dancer, and that when we stop you at that moment, when you want to really push into your lower back, you can rise more easily mm. and more efficiently. Now, in time, the directions get clearer, the organization of the back gets clearer, the, joint, the use of the joint becomes clearer. So here, this is definitely not a quick fix. This is a process. It's fun. 
It's not so much good in an instant coffee culture. This is more like planting the beans, you know, harvesting, grinding, sniffing, finally taking a sip. So that's what we're really doing. And I think as we work and we do this again, we're going to give you a lot more width in your back. I'm going to put my hands right here for a moment. You're going to allow your ribs to hang, just as we did before, and to allow your back to be back and up. So you have a much richer, juicier, tastier breath. Fabulous. Different feeling? Yeah. Now it's that wide back and that ease that we use. Just pivot a little bit, and then you just bend your knees. Now stop. Can you feel yourself wanting to compress? Mm -hmm. Okay. Allow your neck to be free. Allow your head to move out. Now, staying right there, thinking up the front, up the back, but leaving your knees bent, just bend your knees from behind. Fabulous. Stay there again. We have a moment to stop, to rethink our directions, and to allow... I'm going to guide you. I'm sorry. Mm. Took you into the wrong space. There you go. The torso to move up. Easier? Mm. Want to say something? I'm going to let you say something. One thing that's really yeah. uh, key is that if you're going from a standing position to a sitting position, mm -hmm. if you try to keep your focus on the same thing with your eyes that you were before, it throws your head back, Absolutely. allowing your allowing your presence to stay with the position of your head rather than the focus of your your eyes allows your head to stay on a line with the spine as it folds over. Absolutely. So what you're really saying, and it's absolutely true, is that the organization of the, of the back in relation to the head mm. is what is essential. Letting your body and organize it rather than, you know, some, some point of focus outside of you. Right. This is a biggie for people. What happens is that they start to move. It's the eye focus. Mm -hmm. They start to move and mm. they change the focus or they pull back right. like this. So that the complete organization of the back is lost. So eye focus is a very important thing. Mm -hmm. so because we're moving in a very particular organized way. But remember, it's not a position, okay? It it's a, a balancing the point. Presence of your consciousness. Absolutely. You know, where, where you're holding your, your presence. That's right. Instead of being on the object out there, you're staying with yourself. With yourself. This is all about staying with yourself. <clears throat> and what we learn as we do the work a lot is that when you stay with yourself, you can take in more information from the outside. Right. So that's what it is. Yeah. So I'm going to invite you to join William in coming in and out of the chair one more time. And I'd like you to put your hand again at your head and at, we now know, the spot that isn't the waist. And take a moment to think your directions, to free your neck, to allow your head to move up, to allow your torso to lengthen and widen, to let your back stay back. And we're going to pivot on the hip joint and rise. And you're going to free your neck and release your head, letting your pelvis follow your head up. Nice. And in time, of course, we would work to stay back even more, which is really nice for the breath. That's the real beginning of observation in this, in this work and inhibition and direction. Of course, I've said several fun things, you know, like let the torso lengthen and fan into width which we do by visualize, visualizing, oh, I got that one out, and letting the legs release away from the hip joints in opposition to the torso, which we do. Right. And also letting the shoulders release out to the side and float on the rib cage, which we also do. All the concepts of good use come into play when we really do the chair work. And Again, I want to remind people who are watching, this is a slow process. This is not a quick fix. There is time for this change, and the only way to affect the change is to take the time. And that's really important because I think we all run around rushing like crazy people through our lives, and this is about savoring and being conscious in the moment, which we all struggle for. Mm -hmm. So here, we're going to, thank you, <laughs> so I yank your head around. We're going to allow you to think your neck into free freedom again and to allow the head to move up. And I'm going to ask you to begin to allow the shoulders to release out to the side. Ah, and float on the rib cage. It's important to notice that, oh, I touched the wrong place again. There are mics on you. That the 
clavicle goes all the way out to there. The shoulder girdle is like a bony necklace, and it just floats there. Great. So this is the beginning of the chair work. It's something you can all begin to do by yourselves. It's quiet, it's reflective, and you will find that if you pay attention each time that you come in and out of a chair to what you're really doing, that what you see will change, and your awareness will change, and your movement will change, and in time, we will get, you will get a very different kind of experience in your body. And it's a temptation. If I were a younger teacher, I would try to insist on some kind of a change um, in William's back instantaneously. But having lived with this process for a while, I know that that would be exactly the wrong thing to do, and that we're practicing now inhibition, not pushing into the rib cage, and beginning to experience something different and taking the time to do it, which I think is as hard for the Alexander teacher as it is for the student. So this is the beginning of the chair work, and it's something we can all begin in terms of observation and inhibition. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? No. You sure? No questions, okay. no. Would you like to do something? You're positive. Anything you want to do, I want to do. Should we do monkey? I'm going to lead you through the monkey. It is a wonderful tool because monkey in the Alexander work is a way to feel the most powerful energy of the back, to use yourself in your best organization, and it's very practical. From the front, it looks like this. For golfers, it's of infinite importance. For ball players, it's also important. For people who ski, but for those of us who just chop vegetables and brush our teeth, it is also important because it saves the back. You're using your joints. So I'm going to ask William to go into monkey with me. So William, you're going to begin by allowing your neck to be free and allowing your head to be forward and up away from the top of the spine, letting the torso lengthen and widen. And I'm going to ask you, as you go up, to, continue, to bend your knees as though you were sitting in the air behind you. That means, everybody, that your pelvis, stay right there, that's enough, will be behind your legs. Notice how the torso is back and up of the legs. And we're going to go into monkey not by pulling ourselves down, but by going up. Wait, let's wait a second. We're freeing in the neck, we're letting the head move up, and we're going to point you as you bend your knees. Monkey, with the back, back and up. So if William has to pick up something quickly or even just pick up something slowly, he can bend down and get it, and rise, and come up on his hip joints, and his back will be in good shape. So now let me lead you all through it, and we'll do it together. Continue to breathe. That's important to remember you can't do movement without the breath. Notice how you're standing on your feet. You want to be standing on the ball of the foot and the center of the heel, both, allowing your legs to release away from the hip joint, allowing your neck to be free, allowing your head to lead the spine up, to lead the torso into length and width, and you don't have to wiggle at all. And as you think up, you're going to simply bend your knees from behind. Stay right there a moment and continue to breathe. Freeing in your neck, releasing your head. Allow your head to point you up on a long diagonal as you pivot on your hip joint. Monkey. So if you needed to pick something up, any place, you would just bend your knees, reach for your luggage, reach for the child, and come up. And come up all the way up on your hip joints. Beautiful. Now we're going to spend some time walking. The spirit of Alexander is going to be behind us, watching us. Walking is a wonderful activity, and I firmly believe that it's only a wonderful activity if we do it wonderfully. So if you want to get the most out of walking as a great exercise, 
we really have to pay attention to what goes on when we walk. There are several paradigms for walking. You can teach walking in lots and lots of ways. But one is simply mechanically. What are the mechanics? You transfer your weight to one foot, and you bend your knee from the behind on the other leg, and you step with the heel of that foot. The other one, which I love to think about, is the physics of walking, which is that here we are on a revolving planet, revolving on its axis, moving around the sun. And essentially, we are a moving body on a moving planet. In order to go forward, we have to press the Earth away, which is a lovely feeling when we do it. In terms of Alexander technique, what we want to do first is take care of ourselves, stay conscious about what we're doing. And at that moment, we can allow the neck to be free and the head to be forward and up and the torso to lengthen and widen and so forth and so on, so that we can then allow the physics and the body mechanics to take care of themselves. So I'm going to begin by asking William to walk, and let's see if we can all notice what he does when he walks. <laughs> this is an interesting walk, people, and I bet it's one of some of the things that you do are the same. Did you notice how he immediately shifted and came down as he walked? Lots of people do that. Can I illustrate that? I think I'd like to. You take that step and you go this way first. That's one way of getting yourself going. The, sometimes people do other things, so I'm going to pose questions for you. You may find that you are tightening your neck when you walk. You may find that you want to hunch your shoulders when you walk. You may find that you want to push into your lower back when you walk, which of course will kill your lower back. So we want, in Alexander, to think up first, and I'm going to put hands on William and see if we can't get him walking with a little more ease and fluidity. And again, I'm going to remind you, this is a process. There is no such thing as a perfect walk, and that we are simply opening up possibilities, giving you more ways to walk by, sim by giving you, by simply giving you, a neutral walk. So stay where you are. I'm going to ask William to start walking, but this time I'm going to ask him to start not by coming down on one side or another, which is his habit, but by allowing the neck to be free, allowing the head to move up, allowing the pelvis to follow that head so he can freely bend behind the knee and walk away. Does that feel any different? Yeah, it's completely different. It's like walking on the moon rather than <laughs> and on the earth. It's, uh, it's like floating. Great. Hmm. That's the deceptive thing, of course, because you do start to feel as though you're floating. Mm -hmm. And it has a lovely, lovely quality to it because it's easy. So this is very good for walking. Can I, I'd like to take everybody th through that together, all right? Yeah, yeah. So those of you at home, take a moment to take a few steps right now. Take a step, take another step, take another step, and see what happens. Where do you start your walk from? That's very important to know. Now we're going to do it differently, and you're going to see if you can inhibit, if you can say no to your habitual way of walking. It may be do, doing any of the things we've already mentioned. It may be something else entirely. So it's important for you to notice. Before you even start your walk, allow your neck to be free. Allow yourself to breathe. Allow your head to move up, your legs to release away, and continuing to free your neck, allow yourself to start walking. Now, of course, we don't in life often have this much time to start walking. But it is important to know that if we do know what goes on with us when we start, what our habits of walking are, then in time we can pick up the tempo quite a bit, and walk very, very quickly, and still have a good sense of how to use ourselves. We always want to consider that how we use ourselves affects how we function, and that is the ultimate thing. Alexander is an educational tool, but because it is such a good tool, we will feel better when we function better. That's why lots of people who study the technique discover that they have less back pain, less arthritis, less ache, this general malaise. And there's one more thing I would like to add, and we can all do this together. I can do it with William and with you at the same time. 
There's something wonderful in the body that happens when we walk, if we allow it to. Anybody remember we have arms? When we walk and the arms really dangle down, very automatically they're going to do something like this, swing. When they swing, something happens to the spine, and that is so wonderful. I want us all to do it together. So free your neck and let your head go up, and very gently, just let your arms swing a little bit. I hope you can feel it, and if you can't feel it, let your arms swing a little more. Do you notice there's a twist around the spine? Great. That is an essential part of the movement of walking. In our bodies, we have this terrific potential, as we've already talked about, to twist. So that really, it's almost like getting a massage around your spine if you allow it to happen, and it's part of walking. So we have tiny space here, but we're going to give it a shot. We always start with our primary process, to let the neck be free, to let the head move up. And this time, we're going to let the arms just fall, and I'm going to remind William that he has a torso that lengthens and fans into width. There's tremendous width in the body, and he's going to dangle his arms and start his walk and let them just dangle. That's good. So it's easy, and it's fun, and it's pleasurable. Now, the next thing to remember, and you can do this at home on your own, is that when you're walking, you can actually turn your head, too, and look up and look down. So there's not some rigid kind of idea about movement. Movement is electric. Movement is exciting. And this is just to free ourselves to allow us to move more easily, not to get stuck into some kind of thing called an Alexandroid walk. There is no such thing. It's allowing greater freedom in the body and more choices. So this is walking. Now, I'm going to lead you through a lying down lesson that is based on the table work of the Alexander Technique. You can do it at home with William. You will be working lying down on your back. Be sure you're on a firm surface, a carpeted floor, a blanketed table, or, if you are in bed, an extra firm mattress. I will call the surface you are lying on the floor for simplicity. If you are uncomfortable lying down with two legs stretched in front of you, bend one knee so that it is facing the ceiling and your foot is resting firmly on the floor. We begin by directing the mind. If you like, close your eyes. Turn your attention to yourself. Are you aware of your breath? Is your neck tense? Is it thrusting toward the ceiling? Where is your head? Is it balanced comfortably at the top of your spine? Or is it pulling back from the top of your spine so that your chin is facing the ceiling? Is your back even on the floor? Or is one side in contact more than the other? Is the small of your back tight? Are your shoulders resting evenly or is one higher than the other? Is one leg more turned out than the other? Are your thighs tight? Try to notice where you are carrying excess tension or strain. Take time to observe. There is no rush. Tension and stress vary from day to day. It is important to observe these subtle variations as well as to observe your strong habitual holding patterns. Having observed, don't try to fix anything or change anything. Don't try to do anything. Remember, because of the way our brains function, we can affect change in the body by the way we think if our thinking works in conjunction with our anatomy. 
If you respond best to poetic imagery, don't hesitate to use it. You may prefer to visualize your head as a train engine or a boat moving away from the top of your spine, and you may enjoy seeing your spine as cars of the train or a rope following that boat. I'll show you what I mean later in the lesson when we talk about arms. Let's begin with the neck and head. If your neck and chin are thrusting toward the ceiling, place enough books under your skull so that your face can be parallel to the ceiling and your neck can drop back to the floor. You want to avoid pulling your head back and down. You want to allow the neck to soften and lengthen and the head to be balanced well. You may choose to use more books. If you do, be sure your jaw is not jamming into your neck and also be sure that you do not over straighten your neck. Place your fingers on your neck so that your thumbs are on the sides of your neck. The tops of your fingers will be touching your head. Now, let's think. Allow your neck to be free. Allow the muscles to soften like the muscles of a baby's neck. In the front of your neck, on the sides of your neck, in the back. Let your thumbs remind you to let your neck drop back toward the floor. Let your fingers remind you to loosen and lengthen the back of the neck. The tips of the fingers are a reminder that the head is balanced enough forward of the spine to allow the neck muscles to loosen and lengthen. Continue to breathe. Place both index fingers at the hollow at the back of the head where the neck and the head meet. This is the level of the top of the spine inside your skull. If you move your fingers from this hollow around your head to the front, you will discover that the top of your spine is almost behind your eyes. Once more, return your hands to your head and neck. Once more, notice your breath and begin to free your neck. This time, imagine your head moving away from the top of your spine, letting the head lead the spine into length. See the head leading the bones of the neck, the bones of the upper back, the middle back, the lower back, the tailbone. Include the pelvis and the sit bones, the bottom of your pelvis, in this imaginary journey. Now, place your hands on your pelvis, and as you free your neck, visualize your head leading all the bones of the torso I've mentioned, neck, upper back, middle of the back, lower back, pelvis, tailbone, and sit bones. See the muscles of your torso moving into length and width like a fan. In the front, the muscles fan up from the pubic bone to the edges of the shoulders. In the back, muscles move straight up between the buttocks and fan out from the top of the pelvis to the edges of the shoulders. Watch your torso moving into length and width, following your head as you continue to free your neck and to breathe. Once more, return your hands to your neck and head. Using your hands as a guide, remind yourself to free your neck and let your head lead your spine. Refrain from the overwhelming desire to make something happen. Inhibit. Say no to the desire to yank your head away from the top of your spine. Remember, this is a thinking process. There is nothing to do. Everything that needs to happen will happen through the power of your mind alone. You are now ready to start working with legs. Allow your legs to stretch out away from your pelvis. If you're uncomfortable, leave the left leg bent for your ease. Begin with head direction. 
freeing your neck and letting your spine move out. As you continue to direct the spine, lead with the fingers of the left hand. Place your left hand on your right hip now. Place your right hand on your right thigh. With your left hand, you're reminding yourself that the pelvis is part of the torso. And with your right hand, you are suggesting that your leg move away from your torso, away from your hip joint. To locate the hip joint, turn the leg in and out gently. Notice where the movement occurs. It may be closer to the pubic bone than you think. With your right hand, check to see if your right thigh is tense. To reduce that tension or simply to loosen up your quadriceps muscle, point and flex your foot gently three times. One, two, once more, three. Be sure not to take this movement into a full hard point and a full hard flex. It's a loose, baggy knee and ankle. Now, using your mind, imagine your thigh moving toward your knee, your knee flowing toward your shin, your shin elongating toward your foot, and your foot moving away from the bottom of your leg. Are you still breathing? To increase the length of the leg, once more, free the neck, and direct the head and the spine. Notice, to initiate the lengthening of the leg, you begin with the neck, head, and spine. Having released the leg, gently rotate the leg until the knee is facing the ceiling. You can initiate this movement from your foot. Next, you are going to bend your knee, continue to breathe, continue to free your neck, Continue to let your head lead your spine into length. Now allow your knee to bend from behind and float your knee toward the ceiling. Continue to bend your knee until your foot is resting on the floor. Let your lower leg be to the right, outside of the alignment of your thigh. This will help the balancing of your leg and enable you to let go of the inner muscles of the thigh more easily. Visualize your thigh moving toward your knee. See your shin moving toward your knee. Allow your knee to continue to float toward the ceiling. Now, return your hands to your neck and head. Again, Free your neck and let your head lead your torso into length and width. Breathe. You are going to repeat the same process on the other side. So if your leg is bent, if your left leg is bent, allow it to lengthen away from the hip joint along the floor. Leading with your fingertips, place your right hand on the left hip bone and the left hand on your left thigh. With your right hand, you're reminding yourself that the pelvis is part of the torso. With your left hand, you are suggesting that your leg moves away from your torso, away from your hip joint. To locate the hip joint, turn the left leg in and out gently. Again, notice where the movement occurs. With your left hand, check to see if your thigh is tense. Reduce that tension, or simply to loosen up your quadriceps muscle, point and flex your foot gently two or three times. Pointing, flexing. Keep a very loose, baggy knee and a free ankle when you do this. Great. Again, be sure not to do this movement in a full hard point and a full hard flex. Now, 
Using your mind, imagine your thigh moving toward your knee, your knee flowing toward your shin, your shin elongating toward your foot, and your foot moving away from the bottom of your leg. Are you still breathing? To increase the length of the leg once more, free the neck and direct the head and spine. Notice once more that to initiate lengthening in the leg, you begin with the neck, head, and spine. Having released the leg, gently rotate the leg until your knee is facing the ceiling. Initiate this movement with your foot and wait for a moment. Now you are going to bend your knee slowly. Continue to breathe. Continue to free your neck. Continue to let your head lead your spine into length. Allow your left knee to bend from behind and float your knee toward the ceiling. Continue to bend your knee until your foot is resting on the floor. Let your lower leg be to the left, outside of the alignment of your thigh. Visualize your thigh moving toward your knee and your shin moving toward your knee. Allow your knee to continue to float toward the ceiling. At this point, you have changed the relationship of torso to your legs. You may find that your torso feels cramped or shortened. It is important to stretch your torso away from your legs and into its resting length. To do this, you can inchworm yourself away from your legs into length. Or if you're a purist, you can continue to direct your spine toward your head until you reach your resting length. The torso has the capacity and the need to lengthen when it is no longer directly on top of the legs. At this point, your spine will be touching the floor. Notice that your ribs drape down from your spine. Notice that your back is back of your legs and moving toward your head. And now for the arms. Once more, return your hands to your neck and head. Once more, let your hands act as a guide, thumbs encouraging you to free your neck and fingers reminding you that your head is forward and out away from the top of the spine. Stretch your arms away from your shoulders along the floor, straight out to the side. Leading with the fingertips of the right hand, place your fingers on your clavicle toward the center of your upper torso. Trace along your clavicle until you get to the top of your left arm. Notice how wide you are. Return your arm to where it was and do the same thing on the other side. Fingers of the left hand on the right clavicle, tracing the clavicle out. This is your true width. Once more, stretch your arms away from your shoulders along the floor. Leading with the fingertips of both hands, move your arms in a large arc until you're hugging yourself with your elbows pointing toward the ceiling. Move your elbows a little more toward the ceiling, allowing your shoulder blades to move away from each other. Now rest your shoulder blades back on the table or on the floor, and once more lengthen your arms along the floor at shoulder height. Continue to breathe and to free your neck. As your head moves away from the top of your spine and the spine follows, visualize your arms moving away from your torso. Leave your palms facing down on the floor. Now, for fun, see your upper arms growing like elastic bands toward your elbows. Your elbows like balls running down the street toward your forearms. 
your forearms elongating toward your hands like salt water taffy. Imagine space bracelets around your wrists. See your hands moving toward the walls on either side of you. Now very slowly, begin to move your hands toward your sides. As your hands move along the floor, allow your spine to move toward your head as though you were a corkscrew in a bottle. Keep them moving. Stop. Are your arms getting tense? Is your neck tightening? Free your neck. Direct your head and spine again. Let go of the excess tension in your arms. Return to moving your arms. Go slowly. Continue to breathe. Take eight counts to allow yourself to finish moving your arms toward your sides. One, two, three, four. You can put your hands on the floor. Five, six, seven, eight. Bend your elbows and place your hands on your pelvis, elbows facing the walls on each side of you. See your elbows moving toward the walls. While you direct your elbows, allow your upper torso to widen in the front and in the back. As you lie there, think your directions, your concepts of good use. From the beginning, let your neck be free. Let the head be forward and out away from the top of the spine. Allow the torso to lengthen and widen. Allow the knees to float to the ceiling. Allow the shoulders to release out and float on the rib cage. Remember, how we use ourselves affects how we function. The balance of the head at the top of the spine and the good organization of the torso affect how we move. When you rise and walk away, See if you can make new choices. Your thinking can guide those choices and create change. To rise, lead with your fingertips and roll to either side. Take a moment to elongate your spine toward your head and then push to sitting, letting your head lead your spine to a sitting position. Continue to include your breath as you rise to standing, following your head, and you can open your eyes at this moment. Pause. Take time to notice how you feel. How is your neck? The balance of your head. How does your torso feel? How are your legs and arms? hands and feet. Are there any differences, any changes? As you continue your day, take time to notice how you're using yourself. At any moment, you can choose to say no to a non-useful habit. At any moment, you can connect with your breath and choose to free your neck and let your head move forward and up, leading your spine into length. Enjoy it. Do you have any questions? Well, I have a question uh, that, uh, as an actor, interests me more than almost any other. Did FM ever get back to acting? He did. Great. As a matter of fact, he started acting again in Australia, and people commented about his beautiful voice, and they wanted to know how he got that voice, and that's how he started teaching. And there's another funny story. He was teaching his first training class, and he, training is three years mm -hmm. in Alexander. He kept them an extra year so that he could do the Merchant of Venice with him, with them. And guess what he wanted to play? One guess. Sherlock. Of course. No, great. <laughs> and he and did. And he did it? And there were reviews of it, but I don't know. I haven't seen them, but I know mm. that they exist. Great. And he was working with non-actors, but he was impassioned. He was totally desirous of because being Because he couldn't play Portia, so. No, I guess not. 
Although... The quality of mercy. <laughs> if you can't say it. Um, I have another question which has to do with how important the teacher is. And um, because it seems to me in my experience with Alexander that, that there's no way I could have understood it from a book or from simple description. description. I needed and have needed, um, you know, quotes, hands, hands on. on. And I can't, uh, I can't imagine, you know, it without Judy, without you. And also, when you've, if you answer that, can you tell us where we go to find yeah. Alexander teachers? Well, in my experience, a teacher facilitates it enormously. Alexander did it in nine years, but it took him nine years to figure this all out. You know, for most of us, a teacher is important because what we're changing is the um, sensory awareness in the body, mm -hmm. and to do that. If we have a teacher, that it goes much more quickly because the teacher is adding his or her energy. The teacher is actually collaborating with the mm -hmm. student, and it's an important collaboration. So you're changing the way the body thinks. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you can begin, we, we have today, you can begin the powers of observation, inhibition, and your thinking. Mm -hmm. But if you want to have a richer experience or a deeper experience, you work with a teacher. Mm -hmm. You can find a teacher... Actually, if you turn to the credits at the end of this video, because there is a way to get a teacher on the internet, and there is also an 800 number to call and another number. So if you just roll the tape to the end, you can see, you can find how to get a teacher easily. When you think about committing to this and as, a, as a, a road for yourself, as a way to help access you to you, um, when people start thinking about time commitments, what do they think about? Well, that's a really interesting question. Well, I usually tell my students, I don't want to begin to teach you unless you can commit to 10 lessons. Mm -hmm. Because I think in 10 lessons with hands-on, I can give you at least a place to begin. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's very important. Um, I don't like to give a single lesson because people get very confused about what it's all about. Mm -hmm. you know? Even here, there's lots of room for confusion. Mm -hmm. So I like people to commit to 10 lessons. Alexander himself said, give me a student for 30 lessons and they'll have a, something for life. But that was Alexander. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, a very important question. Of course, when people fall in love with the work, they continue to want to do it because they're, like anything else that's of value, the more you use it and the more you stay with it, the more it's there for you and the mm -hmm. more it unfolds for you. Mm -hmm. So that um, I still take lessons. I do exchanges with other teachers. Mm -hmm. um, I care to do that because it empowers me as a teacher and it makes me uh, happier. I mean, I, I, keep, I continue to grow in it. I continue to improve in it. And there's no point in sharing this work unless you're continuing to work on yourself. I'm That's glad the demand. When people talk, you know, honestly about the need for personal contact, even though videos are supposed to replace that in our time, it, it can't be. It can't be. What we can do is make a beginning. We can, we can introduce people to a thinking process. We can say, start to look, start to observe. But we can't really substitute for human beings now, can we? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a quiet revolution.